And next, ladies and gentlemen on women and leadership, please allow me to welcome Ms. Sumaya and Farzana to deliver their presentation. Please give them the biggest round of applause. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Asfar and uh, Martin Rao and Engro and all the labels that are printed over here. Thank you so much for bringing in so many people who have so many different point of views to come and freely discuss those point of views with the expectation and hope that people who are sitting will understand what we are trying to tell you. I, Farzana Yaqub, uh, currently I am CEO of a Center for Asian African Studies. The Center for Asian and African Studies, that's where Sumaya fits in perfectly with us for this discussion. What we when we looked at the market of Pakistan, we saw a lot of deliberation and action orientation towards CPEC, which, is, which means that we started looking uh, towards our East, towards our Chinese neighbors, and the expectation is, and inshallah, that expect, expectation will be a reality, that we are a very important component of a bigger picture, which starts from China. But what we don't seem to be talking about or discussing is that that picture which starts from China actually ends in Africa. CPEC is actually a component of BRI, Belt Road Initiative. And so Pakistan must uh, look towards Africa. We are the shortest routes, route to Africa and we are not reaching out to it. So um, Asfar was kind enough to invite Sumaya, who is based in Kenya, and she will be talking about herself and her country and about Africa. So here we will be discussing the female leadership from a point of view that we think differently. And that is why we started this initiative. Sumaya. Thank you, Farzana. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen, and good afternoon. So it is interesting that our views converged, you know, my perspective on what to talk about in this particular session of women in leadership. So it isn't the characteristics that women leaders bring and the change, you know, that is experienced in organizations. I think there's a lot of research on that, but that's not what I want to talk about today. And that converges, you know, with what Farzana uh, wanted to talk about as well and that if we are talking about the future, are there pieces in this future that we are not talking about? Are there pieces of the puzzle, of the puzzle that are missing? And what could those be? And that would be perhaps the difference in the um, conversation that we want to bring to the table. Coming from Africa, I am the um, CEO of um, Azure Energy, founder and CEO, and I'm also the executive director of Takaful Insurance, which is the only um, insurance, uh, Islamic insurance company that we have in the region. Um, I see tremendous opportunity for linkages between Pakistan and not only Kenya, the, the country that I come from, but Africa as a whole. And I want to share with you some of the perhaps data and statistics around that to back up my argument. We anticipate, and when I say we, it's not just we living in Africa, but I think the, you know, this is widely shared by many thinkers and, and researchers, that the change that we expect to see in Africa over the next 100 years will be much, much more than we have seen over the last 1,000 years. So for example, by 2050, it is expected that four out of every 10 workers in the world will be from Africa. That's just how the dynamics of our demography is. Four out of every 10 workers will be coming out of Africa. One in every five consumers will be coming out of Africa. Bear in mind that over 50% of Africans are under the age of 20, over 50%. If I speak just about Kenya, over 80% of our population is under the age of 30. Africa is an incredibly young continent, and it is growing so fast, not only because of the inherent demographic changes, but also because of improving business environments and rising household incomes. So if you're looking for investment opportunities, if you're looking to expand 
sectors you're, you're currently involved in, if you're looking for partnerships, bear in mind that household consumption in Africa is predicted to reach $2.5 trillion by 2030. This is household consumption. And this has seen increasing demand for goods and services across all levels. Whether it is fast moving consumer goods, targeting the rising middle income and lower income tiers, which are fast moving, low cost, um, we call it the Kadogo economy. Kadogo means small packages. And so that tier of the market, it is estimated disposable incomes at that level, almost $680 billion by 2020. Whether we are talking about food or beverages or hygiene products or appliances or home care, we have a rising luxury goods market in Africa. And again, this is very much influenced by the growing discretionary incomes where we see um, significant growth, not only in those net incomes, but also in the brands that are now coming into Africa to tap into these niche markets that are able, willing, um, and, and very ready to purchase from this particular sector. The other thing that we see very strongly in Africa is the growth of online retail and e-commerce. The African story as far as technology and telecommunications is, can only be described as incredible. Currently, Africa is the fastest growing mobile telecom market in the world. We are seeing roughly a 30% increase in mobile phone connections annually. We are the second largest market for mobiles after Asia. And almost half of all Africans report going online daily. So again, looking at the statistics, it is estimated that the consumer e-commerce market in Africa um, about a year ago was about $5.7 billion. I haven't started talking about the technology explosion in the Silicon Savannah. For those of you in this space, you know that Kenya is regarded as the Silicon Savannah. Um, we have done things that can only be described as amazing. But right now, for us, it has normalized. You know, M-Pesa, mobile money transfer, really, we've, I think, scooped all the awards that can be scooped on that. But the country has moved beyond that. Having such a young population has meant that, like it or not, they are leading us as a country willing or unwilling into the future. And the regulators just have to play catch up. And this is the nature of innovation, that innovation will always precede regulation. And there's just tremendous things that we're seeing happening. One of the most recent signs of the regulator opening up their space in this regard is that our Central Bank of Kenya just, I think last month or so, signed a partnership agreement an MOU rather, with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. And this for us is very encouraging because it means some of the new opportunities and innovations that are coming out into the market find an environment where the regulator is already in partnership with a country that is already very innovative. So there's just tremendous things that are happening within the sector. And these conversations are going on at many levels within the continent. And I want to invite you to join the conversations. So it's not just at the policy level, but I can tell you at the business level, we are having a lot of discussions on just how to change our models in light of the very fast moving environment. I mean, from Takaful, I can tell you one of the things that we are doing that some of the major um, insurance companies haven't been doing yet um, is um, um, climate-based uh, livestock takaful product. This is a livelihood support program which gives pastoralists in extremely poor areas through a technology application on their phone an opportunity to see where the forage or the food for the animals is. And when that forage falls below a certain level, Again, through the technology, the trigger is given and we go in and give support so that the animals don't die. There's just so much happening. 
And I just perhaps want to wrap up my input here before giving it to, uh, back to Farzana by telling you a few of the things that we as a continent are very focused on at the moment. Number one, we are extremely focused at the moment on having a borderless Africa. And for those of you who are looking to expand your opportunities, this is an important data point for you to understand. We want to have unfettered movement of people, goods, and services across the continent. This could perhaps result in gains of about $134 billion a year. We have signed the African um, Free Continental Trade Agreement, and we anticipate that by 2030, if we properly implement this agreement, the combined market in Africa is 1.7 billion people by 2030. Those are the numbers. The other thing we are very much focused on at the moment is the whole area of climate change and what does it mean. And therefore, there is a lot of discussions and programs around climate change research, a lot of investments in renewable energy, and a lot of opportunities for shifting to low carbon. We are very keen on the issue of security, and that has again seen tremendous investments, tremendous discussions, and all sorts of research and projects going on, including from the technology point of view about how to improve security, whether it's cyber security, whether it is human security, whether it's dealing with the issue of geopolitics, for instance, in the Indian Ocean, all the superpowers wanting to come and have their peacekeepers there. What does that mean for Africa? What role do we want to play in this conversation? We are looking very deeply back at our culture and our sports and our arts. We are extremely rich as a continent in all of this. And now going into the future, we are looking at the marriage between the cultures, the traditions, the arts, the sports, and technology. And how can we take this into the future? So this is Africa. This is who we are. We are a continent that is absolutely bursting with opportunity. The future employers, the future employees, the future consumers, the resources, all of this meet in one continent, and we want to invite you, as you look at the future of Pakistan, remember one of the conversations that we really should be having are what are the opportunities that Pakistan and Africa can jointly explore. Thank you. So the idea behind having this conversation about Africa is that the summit is about the potential that Pakistan has for FDI and the brain that we have. But at, while we are considering and attracting people and brains and money to this country, what we should also think about is being the elder of the region and taking other regions along, hold their hands and move forward. And that is the place that we should try to achieve that we take up this cause of moving together forward towards a shared future with our African neighbors just across the ocean. Asia is just as young as Africa, but Asia has had more opportunities. Pakistan is considered as an emerging economy and at the higher end, it's like we're the top end trying to be at the top end of middle class, trying to make a jump towards the higher class. And what we need to do and what we foresee and perceive is that Africa is moving fastly towards that. Now those are all the attractive opportunities that Pakistani business people have. There is a small situation that has um, uh, occurred with, with, uh, within the pharmaceutical uh, industry of Pakistan. That small situation occurred because of a very huge situation within the region, which is where I come from, Kashmir. The issue of Kashmir has highlighted once again, and sadly, it has always been a problem, but it gets highlighted after a few decades uh, when, the, when uh, the conflict from bad 
to worse to goes to severe that is the only time that uh, kashmir is discussed internationally so over 40 days uh, there has been a complete communication blackout in the a region of indian occupied kashmir why i am i have to say indian occupied kashmir because we as kashmiris talk about state of kashmir which is some part of it is actually a free kashmir where i come from azad jammu kashmir where i was part of the assembly where my father was the president and prime minister we have a separate supreme court we have our uh, independence we rely on pakistan for our foreign uh, office foreign services Uh, and our defense because we are not a recognized country at the same time our relatives who are living in indian occupied kashmir uh, do share some uh, in independence but most of it is dependence and that is because of the securitized environment over there so when kashmir flared up because of an indian action Pakistan decided to stop all trades with India and so the raw material that was required by pharma faced a severe severe issue of where are we going to get our raw material and that is where we had this discussion with Sumaya that for a symbiotic relationship we cannot be what it has always been the capitalist capitalistic model of only taking and never giving back what we need to come up with is give and take relationship we should be able to inculcate and bring up raw materials that are within africa that are being extracted but the africans are not receiving their share we are suffering the same when it comes to balochistan which comes to other regions in pakistan we need to grow by sharing and caring and that is what women will bring to this governance structure this administrative structure what men have brought to the world is quantity what we are bringing to that quantity is quality we the women do not need to fit into a frame that has been built and constructed for a man we do not need to fit into the shoes of a man we have our own frames we have our own frameworks and we have good enough shoes to fit into so that is what we will be bringing to this world and that is why it is so important to have women along with men when it comes to decision making that is why it is so important that when conflicts are discussed you have women on board as well because men will discuss strategies and ammunition and how do i bring him down or how do i score more points a woman will be thinking about how do i move along fix this situation in such a manner that i am able to come back and meet this person again and this person will not hate me for whatever i did before so women have a different point of view and a very different mind we think of a hundred things while we're doing one work and most of the married people in this room know that women are multitasking uh men will only be thinking of fixing their car when they come into the house while the woman will be thinking of fixing everything other than that car that her husband wants to fix so the multi multitasking element uh that brings in a lot more and also once again why i come back to the conflict is that it is women and children who suffer the most in conflict men die and women are raped that statement in itself is extremely powerful in conflicts men die once women die again and again and again that's the problem that we need to see and fix and that's the change that we need to bring in our thinking in our decision making and so i bring it all back to what we are here to discuss africa is a very conflict ridden continent so is asia that is because different races were separated in a piecemeal manner by the colonials who left they did not leave it to our choices how we would divide and form our geographical territories we were sliced more so africa than asia as a pizza very straight lines and so tribes 
similar tribes were cut off and fighting tribes were brought together in single countries and so we fight we must respect our culture we must respect all that baggage that we have brought and by respect i don't mean that we take it forward by respect we mean that we need to settle that baggage and leave it once and for all to move on and this is what i think our uh, wonderful uh, uh, love for ourselves that you were saying this this is so important that if we the human beings will not allow ourselves to love ourselves and each other there is no way we will be able to settle at the end two points one kashmir should not be bogged down by india and pakistan whenever kashmir situation gets severe it becomes an india pakistan dog fight it's not it's about kashmiris we the human beings we the families who are separated so some day someone will have to make a conscious decision to talk about people of kashmir and no matter how much the world tries to push you into a situation of deciding whether you are with pakistan or with india please choose kashmir the choice that is not on the table that's we the people and we need you to stand up for us point number 2 when talking about the future we did share a very beautiful future and we must uh, move towards that let us not now develop countries or let us not become countries that have been previously a uh, post uh, colonialism and uh, um, now that we're in the tech so we, i might as well say post capitalism uh, where money attracted money and so the gap between the rich and poor increased this is the time to break that frame not even improve it we need to break that frame to bring people on board we can never be equals that is understandable but we must not be extremely far apart from each other we can slowly and with expectation of understanding each other move closer towards each other and so today is a day and this future summit makes it even so much more important that we change the frames take all the technology discussion that happened today with the intention that the change is not not just going to be technology based that oh my god i'm going to be mo moving faster i'm going to be learning faster my children are going to do better but also that i be the people need to decrease the gap between the rich and the poor and we the asians and africans can do it because we have very strong culture we have always been the kind of people we move in tribes we don't leave our people behind we the people of asia and asia and africa are like that and inshallah if god permits that is how the next century will be the change that we bring the leaders that we will be where everyone will move together thank you